you need one of the handouts, we do have them back there in the back there uh, on the podium in the back. Turn to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. We're going to be in verse 7 here this evening. Matthew 7, 7. By this point of Jesus preaching this Sermon on the Mount, those listening, and I hope you as well, as we've just been going through it on our own here, as we've been reading it and taking a lot longer than it took Jesus to speak just these words that are here in Scripture for us, as we've been going through this, those listening would have been impressed by feelings of their own inadequacy, or at least they should. That's kind of the point. The Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verses 3 to 12, speak of meekness and mercy and peacemaking and, and mourning and poverty of spirit. Matthew 5, 20, this one should kind of really make us feel inadequate, and it certainly would have the people in Jesus' day. Matthew 5, 20 says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, you better be better than the best there is. And everyone in Jesus' crowd would have said, there's no way. There's no way that we can be better than the Pharisees. The, truth be told, the Pharisees can't even be as good as they think they are. Okay, it's, it's meant to make us feel inadequate. Christ elaborates the spirit of the law. For those of us who think that we're, well, I'm, we're doing pretty good. I'm, I'm keeping the law. Jesus says, well, hatred is actually the same as murder. Lust is the same as adultery. Matthew 5, 48 should put the final nail in the coffin of our self-sufficiency and self-righteousness where Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect. Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Jesus has described the proper method of giving, of praying, of fasting, of investing. He's warned against our tendency to attempt to judge the hearts of others and to pass final condemnation. We looked at that uh, last week where he said, judge not, that ye be not judged. When we stack this list of ideals, what we've come through this far, starting in chapter 5, chapter 6, the first part of chapter 7, when we stack all of this list of ideals up next to our actual behavior, we realize quickly that we don't meet God's expectations for behavior for his, his children, for his disciples. Our feelings of inadequacy are not by accident, and so Jesus is going to address that point. So we feel like we can't accomplish God's ideal. We're, we're down here. God's ideal is up here. I can't possibly get there by myself. That's how it's supposed to be. And that brings us here to verse 7 of chapter 7 where we read, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, similar to last week's passage in, in Matthew 7, 1, this is another passage uh, that is often taken and is misquoted and misapplied and wrenched out of its context to, to kind of serve as a, 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 a blank check that God just said, hey, look, I'll give you whatever you want, whenever you want it, however, however you ask for it, I'll just give it to you. That's not what he's saying. We need to interpret it in light of its context, and we'll do that just now. There are three commands in this verse. Ask which means to beg. It actually has the idea of to get down on your knees and beg. Seek means to crave, to demand, to strive after. Uh, we talked about New Year's resolutions this past Sunday. We, we would strive after those goals. That's what this, this context is. That's what this meaning is. Ask or beg. Seek after, strive after. Knock means exactly what you think. means to rap on a door. All of these verbs are present imperatives. An imperative is a command, as you know. A present tense means that they have the idea of continuing. So you could just as easily say, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And our obedience to these commands of Christ, to ask, seek, and knock, this isn't just a, a once and done type of thing. Well, well yeah, I... I sought after God once. Well, no. <laughs> I asked God for something one time. No. No, this is keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. 
Jesus is, added, is describing what our attitude should be when it comes to prayer. As we realize, again, our inadequacy, our insufficiency, when I realize, boy, I'm just not, I'm just not adding up to God's standard. I can't keep Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and the first part of Matthew 7. I can't do that by myself. I need help. So I'll ask. So I'll seek. So I'll knock. And it will be given to me. <clears throat> Notice that there's a growing intensity in each of these. The, the level of activity here in verse 7. To ask. You can ask from another room, can't you? It, well, I, I asked my wife if she'd seen my wallet. To, to seek is, is to get up and to involve yourself a little bit more. To knock is to take to take a deliberate action. I'm trying to seek that person's attention. There's a, there's a growing intensity. Ask, seek, knock, and keep going. It's not a once and done. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And if we do so, there's a promised result. Look here in, let's read verse 7 just to get the whole context. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, Receive it, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Those who keep asking will receive. Those who keep seeking will find, and those who keep knocking will have their request open to them. Now, have you ever had something where you have? Uh, I, I always think of the wallet because when you when you realize that you're missing your wallet. Things get serious very fast. You realize, because I, I carry my driver's license in there, I have credit cards in there, it's a pain to, to replace everything that's in my wallet. So when I lose it, everything focuses in. It's not a, well, yeah, I looked on my dresser and it's not there. No, I'm out, I'm tearing things apart. I'm looking in closets. I'm looking in all the coats in the house and I'm interrogating the children and I'm in the car and I'm everywhere and I'm looking for my wallet. Why? Because it's serious. That's, again, that's what this is. Those are the ones who receive, not those who say, yeah, I asked God for something one time. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I tried, to, I tried to, to speak with God one time. No, this is a, a continuing action. Who are these promises made to? Here in verse 7 and verse 8. Who is this speaking to? Christians. Well, Christians, absolutely. If you look back, you'll see in chapter 6, verse 32, where it says, for your, your heavenly Father. Okay, so he's speaking to believers. He's been speaking to believers for all of chapter 6 and now into chapter 7, he's speaking to believers. These promised results, this isn't true for unbelievers. This isn't true for the lost. This is true for those who've been born again into the family of God. If I ask and keep asking, I'll, I'll receive. If I keep seeking, I'll find. If I keep knocking, it will be open to me. He gives a human example. Again, remember, this is in context of my inadequacy to do what God would have me to do. I don't meet up to God's standard. Before I accepted Christ as my personal Savior, I didn't add up to God's standard. That's why I needed a Savior. And guess what? Following salvation, it's impossible for me to lead a consistent, victorious Christian life without Him. And we're going to see that. That's what I'm knocking. That's what I'm seeking. That's what I'm asking for. Lord, help. Help me to go from my inadequacy to finding your adequacy. Help me to go from my insufficiency to the sufficiency of Christ. I keep asking, Lord, I need you right now. I need you today. I need you this afternoon. I need you in this meeting. I need you on this phone call. Lord, I need you right now. That's what this is all about. It's continued action. To, to ask God to help me to, to have that sufficiency that he promises. He gives us a human example in verse 9. Or what man of you is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? Jesus gives the example of a human father. And I've used this example multiple times. 
When it comes to a human father meeting the legitimate needs of his children, bread and fish were staples of the day. It, it would be cruel for a father whose child comes to them hungry to, to give them a rock and laugh at them as they break their teeth. In this day, the idea of giving a serpent, some have said, well, a serpent's poisonous, it's going to kill them. Well, also, in Jewish culture, snakes were unclean. You don't eat serpents, okay? So that either one, serpents, they might be dangerous, but they're certainly unclean. A good and a loving father won't give that to his child who comes to him seeking uh, genuine needs. These are rhetorical questions. A father would give his children exactly what they need. Verse 11 is where he makes the parallel. If ye then, being evil... Now, it, what, what's, he, what's he saying here? Is he calling all the parents, everybody there is as bad as they could possibly be? Is that what he's saying? No, he's, he's drawing a comparison, okay? Remember, God is here. He's perfect. He's holy. He's righteous. And I'm here. A, a good description of me compared to God is, I'm evil. <laughs> okay? That's what Jesus is saying. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask of him? If I, being sinful... Love my children enough to meet their needs. How much more will my heavenly father meet my need? If I'm going to live like a child of God, a disciple of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom, which is what this whole Sermon on the Mount is pointing towards, the kingdom. It's only going to happen by the divine enablement given by God. The distance between my inadequacy and his holiness is not going to be bridged by human effort. Now, Luke is the parallel passage to this. Luke 11 gives us a little bit more. It gives us some very, very important information. It's there in your handout. If you look, 11, Luke 11, 13, same verse, but listen for the difference. He says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give... What's, what's it say? The Holy, the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Now, if you look in Matthew 7, verse 11, it says, How much more shall your heavenly Father, or how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Okay? Luke gives us just a little bit more information. This is important. What's the difference between my inadequacy and the standard of, of righteousness that God asks of me? It's right here. It's the Holy Spirit. When Luke says, Shall, won't your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Galatians 5, 16. This is kind of the key to Galatians. We covered it a few uh, weeks ago on Sunday evening. Where the Apostle Paul says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's so much difference between my inadequacy and his sufficiency... I, I can't do it. But if I walk in the Spirit, I can. Do I get the credit if I'm walking in the Spirit? Could I come in here and I say, I am <laughs> I, I'm really walking in the Spirit right now. That doesn't, even, that doesn't work, does it? You'd say, no, no you're not. Why? Well, because that's not what the Spirit sounds like. How do you know what the Spirit sounds like? Well, I read His Word. And he, the, the Lord hates a proud look. Right? So, when I am walking in the Spirit and I'm living up to God's ideal, it's not, well, I give myself a pat on the back, I'm doing pretty good. No, it's, it's all God. <laughs> He's the one who gets the credit for it. John 15, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. When you walk past a, an apple tree... And you see lots of apples. When we were driving up here, up 55, uh, the one fellow there off to the west had a bunch of apples and, and just loaded down. The trees were touching the ground. So many apples. As I was riding by, and I did countless times throughout the time when they were harvesting apples, never once did I look over there and think, man, look at that, look at that branch. Look at that branch. 
No, I said, I would say to my wife, look at those trees. I, I didn't point out the branch, but that one particular branch there, that's the way it is. If we're abiding in Christ, no one's going to look at you and say, well, that's just an exceptional branch right there. No. Why does the branch bear apples? Because it's hooked to the tree. What happens if it breaks? It stops bearing fruit. So there's, there's no room in the distance between my insufficiency and his holiness. There's no room in here for my pride. There's no room in here for me to say, wow, did you see what I did? Because I can't do anything. In and of myself, I fall short every single time. Ephesians 5.18 says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's God's plan. God's plan for you to live a holy life for you. Again, if you go back to chapter 5 and chapter 6 and you look at that and you start feeling bad about yourself and you say, boy, I just can't do this. You can't. You need Christ. You can't do. You can't live a, as a good citizen of the kingdom all by yourself. You need Christ. That's the point. I've heard often. And from well-meaning people and many times, I've heard them say the phrase, well, God will not give you more than you can handle. I know what they mean, but there needs to be a major disclaimer with that. God regularly gives me more than I can handle. Okay? I can handle. Now, it's very true. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay? I cannot do all things by myself, and neither can you. God often gives us more than we in our own strength can handle, but he'll never give us more than can be dealt with if we're walking in the Spirit. If I'm listening to the guidance of the Spirit and I'm walking with him, I'm in his word, I'm enabled with power from above, that's, that's all the difference that's needed between my best efforts, which are insufficient, and his standard. I can't, I can't save myself from sin. I can't justify myself by meeting his standard. And I can't walk in the power of my own flesh and satisfy him and please him after salvation. Just as, remember, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk ye in him. If I was saved by grace through faith, I am now to walk by grace through faith. I'm to walk in the spirit. The answer is Christ in me, the Holy Spirit's guidance and my obedient submission. How can I pray and fast without allowing pride to take root? By, by the Spirit, if I'm led by the Spirit. How can I keep from lust in 2023? That's a tall order. <laughs> How can I keep from lust in 2023? Well, I need to walk in the Spirit. How can I keep from becoming obsessed with materialism and all the stuff that the world has to offer? Well, by laying up treasures in heaven. And how am I going to do that? Well, by walking in the Spirit. The answer to all of our problems. It's almost, it, it, it's almost oversimplified, isn't it? You say, well, you don't know my problems. Well, the answer to your problems, after you explain them and you lay them out, the answer to your problems and the answer to my problems, however complicated they may be in my mind, the answer is walking in the Spirit. The answer is doing exactly what the Spirit of God would tell me to do. Being aware, asking for His help, seeking His help, knocking on the door continually. Lord, I need you. I need you now. I need you right now, too. And Lord, I'm going to need you later. I need you, we sing the song, I need thee every hour. That's a good, a good mentality for us to have. How can I have this power? How can I access it? Well, by accepting Christ as Savior and being, uh, being baptized into Christ and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that, that baptism of the Spirit where I'm placed into Christ, okay? That's the beginning. You can't have this if you're lost. Can a, can a lost person walk in the Spirit? No, what is the one thing that the Spirit of God is going to lead a lost person to do? Trust Jesus Christ. That's, that's the one thing that the Holy Spirit of God is going to lay on the heart of a, of a lost person. He's going to convict them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. 
How can I have this power? Well, by continual, habitual, regular, moment by moment, yielding to the Spirit's leading rather than the des desires of the flesh. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier when we started that these verses, just like verse 1 gets pulled out of context. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, the Bible says you can't judge. You've heard that. I've heard that countless times. This gets pulled out, maybe not quite as regularly as that, but these verses get pulled out of context. These verses are only for believers, okay? A, a lost person who says, well, I just, I just keep asking God, and I think he's going to answer. God may, in his mercy, God gives rain to the just and the unjust, but, but the prayers of a righteous man are the ones that are heard. These are not blank checks. This is not, well, I, I take my wish list and I take it to God and he says that if I come and I ask that he'll give it. That's not what this means. To apply it that way is setting yourself up for disappointment. These verses are not God promising to give me whatever I want whenever I ask. Listen to these verses and tell me what the condition is. Psalm 37.4, you know this verse. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That sounds great, doesn't it? God's going to give me the desires of my heart. What do I need to do first? I need to desire. I need to, I need to delight myself in him. What does that mean? What's going to happen? Well, as I truly delight myself in the Lord, what's going to happen to my desires? They're going to become his desires, aren't they? And then he'll give me the desires of my heart. Psalm 84, 11. Listen to this. See if you can hear the condition. He says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. What, what do I need to do if I want him to not withhold things from me? Walk uprightly. Walk uprightly. Well, that, that hardly seems fair, does it? <laughs> it's more than fair. Although it, it's not God saying, hey, look, I'll give you whatever you want. No, God says, you delight yourself in me. You walk uprightly, and I'll give you the desires of your heart. These promises that we're looking at here in verses 7 and 8 regarding prayer are to be understood and interpreted in the light of their immediate context, the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Again, And the context is chapter 5, chapter 6, the beginning of chapter 7, you can't meet God's standard. You can't meet it for salvation, and you can't meet it for sanctification. You need him. You need a savior to save you from yourself and from your sin and from hell. You also need a savior to enable you. You need the Holy Spirit to enable you to, to meet up to God's standard. That's the only way you can meet up to God's standard. As we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we need to interpret this in light of that. We also need to interpret verses 7 and 8 in light of the context of all of Scripture when it comes to prayer. I want to give you just, uh, just four principles on prayer. You've got them there in your handout. Four principles when it comes to prayer. Number one, prayer must come from a cleansed heart. Prayer must come from... From a cleansed heart. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Again, that we'd say, well, that hardly seems fair. No, no, that's just the way it is. That's what God says. If I regard, to regard means to grant a place of honor. Meaning this, if I love my sin too much to confess and forsake it, I'm prohibiting my own prayers from being answered. If I regard iniquity in my heart, I say, you know what? I, 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 I just, I know it's wrong. I just can't let go of it. Well, well then I shouldn't be surprised when my prayers go unanswered because of, of this verse. The Lord says that whoso covereth his sin shall not prosper, prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. That's, that's what God would have us to do. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful. He's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin that I hold on to, unwilling to confess, unwilling to forsake, will prevent my prayers from being answered. That's what this verse says. 
Number two, just another principle about prayer, since we're talking about prayer. Prayer must be in faith. James 1, verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. When the children of Israel sent the twelve spies into the promised land, you remember this, they came up to Kadesh Barnea, that's on the southern uh, por portion of the promised land, and they sent in twelve spies, one from each of the twelve tribes, and, and they sent them in, and they took 40 days, and they wandered through the, the land of Canaan, and they brought back the great big grapes and everything. You remember this? Ten were bad, and two were good. Caleb and Joshua were the only two who came back with a faithful report. The others came back with an evil report. They doubted God's ability to deliver the land into their hand. Why do we call Canaan the promised land? Who is it promised to? Promised to the children of Israel. Who promised it to them? God. Do you figure God knew about the giants in the land? Yeah. Okay. But they looked at it, and they, they didn't have faith. As a matter of fact, Psalm 78, 41 says, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Is God bound by anything? No, but my faithlessness can put an artificial limit, at least in my mind. <laughs> and that's silly. That's silly, isn't it? If somebody were to come to you and they say, I've, I've got a problem. Say, say that somebody comes to you that they've got a problem with their car. And they say, I've, I've got this problem. I, my, car's, my car's broken. And you say, well, why don't we pray about it? And they say, I don't even think God can deal with this. <laughs> what would you say to them? <laughs> he's, he's a, um, you don't understand how big God is. Your car is nothing. God created the world. God keeps everything running. God knows all about it. God can fix your car. God could give you a new one. God can do anything. But, but if that person, when they pray, they say, Lord, I don't, even, I don't even think you can do this. But what are they doing? They're, they're putting a limit. God doesn't have limits. But it's them putting a boundary on God's power, and, and that's not good. That's a good way to, to lose the, the object for which we pray. Prayer must be in faith. Number three, prayer must be according to God's will. 1 John 5, verse 14, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So I need to pray according to the will of God. How can I, as a, as a man, possibly know the will of God? Well, he gave me this great big book, and it's full of his promises, and it's full of his, his direction. And as I read his word, I'm made aware of his will, and I pray. Would it be okay if, if I pray, I say, uh, if, if somebody is, is looking for a wife and they pray and they want somebody else's wife, you, you'd say, no, that's not God's will. How, well, how can you know it's not God's will? Well, because God said right here, right? I can know God's will by God's word. And I need to pray according to God's word and God's will. And then lastly, and we could go on, I could give you lots more, but I won't for sake of time. Prayer is to be persistent. Even here in verses 7 and 8, remember, present imperative, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Luke 18, verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. 1 Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. You won't wear God out. You can go back to him tomorrow with the same request that you had today. You can go to him tonight with the same request you had this afternoon and this morning. God delights in that. So when it comes to living a life pleasing to God, we should feel inadequate in our own strength. I should look at, at the task of leading a holy life and I should say, there's no way. There's no way I can do that. But then again, Philippians 4.13 but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We must call out to God for his strength. I need to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Lord, I need to be regularly aware of just how, how helpless I am in my flesh. But I have a good 
and a wise heavenly father. And if I like giving my children what they need, being, being a wicked man, how much more does my perfect heavenly father delight to give me what I need to live up to his standard? God sets up an impossible standard, but then he gives us the power to meet it. The power is the person of the Holy Spirit who enables us to live according to his will.